Hi, everybody. This is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. It's Monday, August 26th, and today we're going to take a look at Mars uh, moving into um, a conjunction with the Sun. Uh, the two planets are coming together. Um, technically, we should say the Sun is moving into a conjunction with Mars, um, but the two are coming together in the next week or so into the early part of September, and uh, we're going to try to take a look today at that sequence and what it might mean for each of you and myself. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and put the chart up on the screen as usual so that I can show you what's going on. Now, before I do that, I want to give some of you a heads up about the astrology of today. <clears throat> Main point of this talk will be to get into Mars and the conjunction with the sun, which I will illustrate for you right here. Venus and Mars just came together. And now the sun is about to conjoin with Mars. Currently, that makes Mars um, combust. We're going to talk about what that means. And then the Sun is going to move into a Kazemi with Mars. Recently, the Sun moved into a Kazemi with Venus. So this is kind of a unique opportunity. The other thing that we're going to take a look at um, today is the fact that Mercury is in the Sun sign and the Sun is in Mercury sign. And uh, what this means, considering that Mercury is also combust. So this little grouping of planets needs a proper analysis. That's what we're going to do. Um, most of the time I'm going to spend with Mars and the Sun, but I'll cover this other detail of Mercury and the Sun uh, briefly as well. Now, before I get to any of that, I want to talk about the astrology of today. Just because uh, it's always good to pay attention to the moon and what the moon is doing day by day by day. In case you need a refresher on why we pay so much attention to the moon, the simple answer is this. The moon represents the comings and goings of our everyday life in the material world. So when you think about um, the flow of activities on every given day, the moods that you have and how they change, the interesting circumstances that you run into, the plan that you have as well as the plan that you don't have, the things that uh, happen because you're intending as well as the things that happen just due to circumstance. The moon is really a good indicator of the flow of events here in the material world. In fact, ancient astrologers thought of the moon as um, a kind of satellite that collected the lights of all of the other planets and then disseminated them through the elemental spheres, which would blend and commingle so many permutations and fluctuations, creating the material circumstantial changes and fluctuations of our everyday life here. Now, that's old sort of, <clears throat> sort of Aristotelian idea about the moon and the impact on the elements, and we don't have to take that literally. Um, but what we can say is that there is this thought that the moon, at least symbolically, represents the flow of events. And that flow of events uh, will um, uh, be most easily traced by a few things. When we look at the moon in particular, we can look at these things. The moon's dignity, which means whose house is it in, right? So today, for example, the moon's in cancer. That's its own house. The moon gets to be extra moony when the moon is in its own house. If the moon was in somebody else's house, say, for example, it was in Libra. If the moon is in Libra, then it's in Venus's house, in which case the moon is going to behave in a Venusian way. It has to. It has to adapt to the house that it's in. If the moon is in Venus's house, it also has to adapt to whatever Venus is doing or whatever Venus is able or unable to do by means of Venus's current position and its relationship with the moon aspectually. Uh, so it can get quite complex, actually. It's very nice whenever a planet is in its own sign because then the planet is just free to do what it wants like you or me hanging out in our own bedroom, you know, or in our own kitchen or whatever. Uh, you know, you're free to just, you, you know, you're, you're free to just dunk Oreos with your fingers like right into, you know, you know, that kind of thing. So, all right. So the moon day is in the sign of cancer. And it is moving through zones that are, have been previously uh, activated by eclipses this summer. It's moving through Cancer where we had an eclipse in July, uh, solar eclipse. And then it's opposing Saturn. It's going to you know, hit the North Node, oppose the South Node. It's going to oppose Pluto. Um, so what can, we, what can we expect from all of this? Now, we're going to leave aside, for example, 
you know, you could say the moon has some whole sign sextiles to all this stuff in Virgo, a sextile to Uranus, a trine to Neptune, you know, we're going to leave all that out. And we're just going to focus today on the most dominant aspect that everyone should probably be feeling or noticing, which is the opposition to Saturn. So what does that mean? What can we take from that? All right. Well, whenever the moon is opposing a planet, generally speaking, there's going to be tension relative to the nature of the moon, what it is in and of itself, and relative to the nature of the planet it's opposing. So for example, let's say the moon likes to nurture, then whatever it's opposed to will present some kind of tension, challenge, difficulty, maybe positive, doesn't necessarily have to be negative, uh, for the goal or agenda of the moon, which is to nurture. So uh, for example, you want to nurture, but the moon is opposite Venus. You might be choosing between doing the thing that feels right, that feels safe, that feels um, kind, warm, comforting, and something that is a little bit more sexy, right? Or something that's like a little bit more flashy or likable or popular or artistic. And there could be a little tension between those things. Now, that could be a creative tension as well, right? The creative tension could yield uh, some kind of interesting synthesis. If the moon's opposite Venus, you may find that you're, uh, you're hanging out with a, a group of women that you consider your sisters, and they're all also mothers, and they all have their children along. Okay, so simple. And it might be tense to like try to be sisters together while you're all also trying to be mothers, and you all have different mothering or parenting styles. So that would be an example of the moon opposite Venus, where that tension could be positive and negative at the same time. And that's just a simple example, right? Most of the time, our lives are fairly simple, right? I mean, if you think about the way we spend our everyday lives, you know, like my morning times, most days of the year are pretty regular. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I have my routines. And um, uh, my, my spiritual practices, once I'm inside of them, are I think pretty, you know, rich, but like from the outside, it's like, yeah, Adam meditates every morning or whatever. Do you know what I mean? So similarly, like you might have your cup of coffee or you might, whatever we do in the mornings, like that's pretty much what we do. And similarly, most of our days are shaped by stuff that we do a lot of. This is why karma is also hard to change because we build up these samskaras, the, the yoga philosophy tells us these kind of grooves in the record track of the soul. And, um, we're familiar. And it's like, it's like trying to get your, if you've ever had your car go slightly off the road onto off the lip, and then you're like, ah, I got to be careful getting back up onto the road because once you've got one tire off, it's a little treacherous, right? It's a little, it's a little challenging. You have to figure out how to do it. Or like if you've ever ridden a bicycle and you're going on pavement, then all of a sudden you hit a patch where, you know, it's all dirt or, you know, sand or something like that. All of a sudden you're like, whoa, so similarly, we, each of us, the soul likes familiarity. It likes comfort. It likes habit. It, and it finds safety in that. And so the samskaras that we have, they're hard to change, right? It's not, they're not easy to change. So a lot of our life is defined by regularity. This is why the moon's signatures that we see aren't always going to be super dramatic. You're going to hear astrologers regularly talking about the uh, astrology in a way that's usually very dramatic, right? It's like, big transformation. Oh my gosh, look at the energy. Da, da, da. But really what we need to do is look for ways of understanding astrology in terms of simpler things and subtler things. But that's when you can really see astrology at work. And that's when astrology can actually start to grow and flourish in your, in your mind. It can become a language that's actually useful instead of one that you go to when you're in sort of life's fight or flight mode. Um, and it can be there. It, it's almost like a lot of people tune into astrology because they're like, yeah, I'm going through something crazy. Let me turn into the astrology. And then once things settle down, they're like, yeah, the astrology just feels like it's always crazy, right? We need to fix that. So one of the ways of fixing that is just paying attention to simple lunar transits. Now, for those of you who like listen to my channel, you're like, oh my God, get to the point already. But if you, if you, <laughs> if you listen to my channel, you know that I will make you suffer through understanding astrological philosophy because I'm a teacher and I want people to grow in how they use astrology. Okay, so soapbox over. Now, the moon today, the moon is also a planet that is most related to our samskaras, those grooves, because the moon likes to get into a groove. The moon is like an ecosystem. It works best if there's pretty regular, familiar patterns of exchange, uh, patterns of relationships that more or less are circular, 
right? Just like the moon likes to wax and then it likes to wane and it goes round and round. It's very predictable. Yeah, it's loopy, right? It moves all around the path of the sun, kind of snaking around it. Uh, just like the, you know, the energy that's coiling around the spine, like that's very lunar. Um, but the, um, the basic thing is that we like to find grooves or patterns. When you go see a therapist, for example, a lot of what you're doing is trying to understand your own grooves or patterns. Okay. So the moon in cancer is like the quintessential place of like, I feel safe. I feel nice. I feel cozy in my patterns. Or it can also be a place where, you know, we reflect upon things uh, from the past. It's a place of nostalgia and romance, poetry. You know, you kind of got uh, the cancer. Your moon is sort of like the moon child. It has a, a sense of wanting everything to be together in almost a reflective or nostalgic sense, like remembering what it was like to be in the womb. And that can make some really artistic, sweet, interesting, mysterious um, personalities and atmospheres. Okay, so that's the moon's agenda. That's what the moon is interested in. But today and into tomorrow, it's heading through oppositions to Saturn and Pluto and reactivating eclipse energy. So what to watch for? First of all, Saturn is a planet that has to do with, its, its nature is opposition, is separation, is isolation, is boundaries, is barriers. So for example, oftentimes when you see moon opposite Saturn, you see families dealing with separation. Uh, you see uh, divorce. You see moon opposite Saturn, you're going to see um, being alone, cut off, traveling in a way from your family, missing something, nostalgic for something. You see a family member who's ignoring you, who's cutting you out somehow. Those are all moon Saturn types of things. Now this is, uh, remember, the reason that it's, you know, this transit is going to happen once a month, moon opposite Saturn. So the moon moves through all 12 signs. So it's going to oppose Saturn a lot. It's not like this is like, oh my God, it's, it's so unique. Um, but the reason that it's unique right now, that every time the moon makes this aspect, that it's going to be a little bit more dynamic right now is because we have eclipses in Cancer and Capricorn with Saturn and Pluto in Capricorn. So whatever we're working on around these themes of being in, being, feeling like we know where we belong, family, home, domestic life, a place to rest our head, an ecology around us that we feel at home in, the environment and how we're concerned about that on a global scale, um, right? Those are all the lunar concerns that are really strong right now because of the eclipses. And then you've got the opposition to Saturn. So the opposition to Saturn says, you know, the Amazon is burning or, you know, there's problems in your family or, you know, you're, you're moving or you're dislocated or you're feeling cut off or, you're trying to have a kid, but you are having trouble getting pregnant or, you know, so it has that feeling of like the moon really wants, you know, sort of peace on earth to be, you know, basically like a, 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 um, a warm place and a, a comfort and a familiarity and a regularity, even like life isn't perfect, right? And the cancer moon doesn't need life to be perfect, but it does need there to be some consistency, some sense of stability. So, the opposition to Saturn challenges that. It also challenges, you know, you have issues around the black sheep in the family, right? The, the, the insider versus the outsider. Um, you can also have uh, the kinds of issues where, you know, there's a feeling of like make a choice, like a civil war or the, the feeling of having to make a choice but of different emotional loyalties. Cut this person off and be with me right? Trying to divide people's loyalties. That's also very moon Saturn. And this is again, stronger right now in general because of the eclipses. So you're going to watch for this in the next 24 hours. Watch also for the, the death and rebirth, the, the uh, themes of the subterranean, the underworld, uh, themes of things surging up from below the surface, kind of, it, you know, kind of like a volcano where it just it just something just blows and it's emotional and it challenges the immediate environment or there's some you know it would not be unusual to see problems in the home property family domestic life parents mothers um, issues around women and children and just challenges around those things you're also dealing with the motif of the cold mother the distant mother uh, that's a moon saturn dynamic as well as the dark mother the manipulative or power hungry mother um, and that mother figure is archetypal it doesn't necessarily have to be you know a, a woman per se 
but it's just, it, you know, if you think about that, look for that pattern, look for that figure somewhere. Um, you also can think about, again, uh, things that are being done to harm, challenge, or threaten families, mothers, homes, property, land, and so forth. Uh, so these tensions are pretty dynamic for like the next 24 hours or so watch for them. Now there's a lot more I could say, but I don't want to make a huge long, uh, more of a huge long treatise than I've already given on this topic, but hopefully that's helpful for you. Now what I want to move into is as promised, we're going to spend some time today talking about Mars and the sun, but I also want to talk briefly about Mercury and the sun. So Mercury is in Leo home of the sun, and the sun is in Virgo, home of Mercury. Not only is it the home of Mercury, it's the exaltation of Mercury. So this is a very powerful uh, exchange called a mutual reception. Mutual reception is like, uh, it's like, it's like house swap, right? It's like, hey, how about I spend a week at your house and you spend a week at my house? And if this also is happening with someone that you really like, let's say, you have some particular skill, like you're a really good organizer. And let's say your friend is a really good interior designer. And let's say your friend has a beautiful home but has trouble staying organized. And let's say you're very organized but you have trouble making your home you know, look beautiful, right? Uh, this would be an example of mutual reception where a house swap could be really nice, right? You're like, hey, I'm gonna go make your house more beautiful and you're gonna go make my house more organized. Now, Something similar is happening with the sun and Mercury, except for the sun and Mercury are a little bit different than an organizer and a designer. So let's talk about what they are. Mercury might actually be an organizer. That wouldn't be so bad for Mercury. But Mercury is really about articulation. It's about language. It's about communication and thought, interpretation. Um, Mercury is uh, really kind of like the, your spirit guide. Mercury is the one who translates your inter and, and interprets your experiences for you. Like, okay, I'll give you a simple uh, example. A lot of times in my yoga practice and having a yoga studio for 10 years, we have a lot of students who come through and something like this happens. They'll be like, I've, I've been meditating, you know, a little bit every day for like a year. And, you know, it's been really nice. It's been helpful, but I'm not quite sure that I'm seeing any long-term, um, I'm not seeing any long-term benefits or I'm not really seeing any deeper changes. Like I'm still struggling with a lot of things I was struggling with. <clears throat> and then I'll ask a few more questions. I'll say, well, have there been any other significant changes in your life in the past year? Oh yeah, actually I just got out of a relationship that I'd been in for a few years. It was really um, very difficult. Um, but uh, you know, I'm feeling better now. I'm feeling it was the right decision and uh, and yeah, but I still haven't lost weight or I still, you know, I struggle with my boss or I, you know, I'm, I'm still like having a really hard time with a spouse or a, a sibling or, or not a spouse in this case, but like a sibling or a parent or something like that. And I'll always point and I'll say, what made you break up with the partner? Like in this case, this example has actually happened a few times in my astrology practice as well. What made you break up with the partner? Well, I just realized that they weren't really healthy for me. And I'll say, um, how did you realize it? And then they'll kind of laugh and they'll say, the meditation, right? So sometimes we need someone to help us reflect upon and interpret our experiences so that we can see the way that things have been working in our life or the way that things have been evolving or developing because we can't see it because we're so in the thick of it that we just, you know, we lose track of it. So Mercury is like that. Mercury is like the hermeneutical guide of our life. It's the one who gives you that aha moment. Has meditation been working? I guess it has. I, I've been doing it kind of every day for a little bit. And, you know, I got out of a relationship that wasn't so great. And yeah, come to think of it, meditation actually had a lot to do with that, even if it was only five minutes a day, right? So Mercury gives you that little insight. Mercury connects the dots, right? So we have that going on. Now, the sun is a little bit different. The sun is similar to Mercury, but, they, but, but is where, whereas Mercury is almost like your personal daimon, your personal spirit guide, um, the sun is actually your own higher intelligence, right? This, you can think about it that way, where I've used this example many times before, but in life, we go around and we see a lot of associative patterns and symbols, like all around us. 
But at some point we have to make judgments between them as to what's true and false. Simple example, um, you know, uh, for, I'll give you, this is actually one that happened uh, last night. So um, I went outside, right, onto my porch with my dog to let my dog out before going to bed. And there's this little, I don't know how to explain, explain it. It's like a little art piece hanging that we have that has some straw on it. And the straw rubbed me on the, uh, on the forehead and I thought, oh my God, there's a moth like in my hair, right? Like, so, like a bug. And so I was, you know, it went crazy. And then, oh yeah, it's the, it's the straw hanging thing. I'm sure that's happened to you before or something like that has happened to you. So my mind, my senses can make bad decisions based on the data I'm collecting. My higher intelligence is the one that comes in and discerns and says, actually, that's true or that's false. That's a false impression. That's a true impression. That's a mirage. That's actually real. And the more we cultivate that higher intelligence, which almost all spiritual traditions tell us that we need to do through things like sadhu, being around saintly people who have been on a spiritual path for a long time, shastra, reading things like the Tao Te Ching or the Bhagavad Purana or the Bhagavad Gita or even the uh, biblical scriptures, reading wise people and what they've had to say. And, that, and that, of course, there's lots of examples of, you know, where wisdom comes from. I like Mary Oliver. So I think she's pretty wise. You know what I mean? So, but wisdom. And then we also need, uh, 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 we need Sangha. We need community, right? So, and, uh, and sadhana, practice, everyday practice. So, anyway, there's a few things that we need. And when we do those, our higher intelligence improves. And as it improves, so too does our receptivity to the voice of our spirit guide. Because our spirit guide is always trying to talk to us. But if we're in the mode of ignorance, if our channel's not very clear, then we can't hear that guide very well. Our higher intelligence is dulled, means we can't hear Mercury so well. So Mercury and the sun and mutual reception, you know why it's awesome? Because it's like polishing up the higher intelligence and opening up the channel so that we can really hear guidance, so that we can really be intelligent. Now, if people are using intelligence for the sake of some kind of selfish gain or selfish motive, that would be possible right now as well because the sun-mercury uh, mutual reception with mercury under the beams of the sun might mean that there is a sort of secretive element or there's a plotting or planning behind the scenes because mercury is invisible right now but in cahoots with the sun. Uh, so it's not like it's an entirely, it, it really depends on who you are and what you're doing with it. But this set of symbols is really indicating to us that the opportunity right now to dial into our higher intelligence, to make wiser decisions, and to just be in touch with our, the voice of, um, of, our, of guidance, right? Uh, that's there right now. And it's kind of nice because one of the things that I really enjoy, I really enjoy when my, you know, let's call it my little spirit guide. I think I have one. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you guys know what it's like if you have one too. Um, when I hear mine, you know, going off or, or whatever, um, I like it when it, I like it when that voice is less sort of, um, how can I put this? This is hard to explain. There's two ways that my little voice talks to me anyway. One of them is very overt, right? It's like, do this, do that, right? And, it, and it's more like action oriented. Fine. Uh, then there's a way in which there's these insights and realizations and they seem to open my heart up more. They, something feels like it's a flower inside of me that's opening more. It's like, wow, that was that was not just an insider like, yes, you know, eat Cheerios, you know, <laughs> I don't know, like, don't, it's not something that I have to do. It's something that I'm like beholding. And of course, you know, maybe it's just the, the kind of romantic or, or kind of poet artist in me, but I just love that. I love when I get some kind of insight and it takes me into kind of a private wonderland, just reveling in, in beauty, like, wow, you know, the d divinity is just so beautiful. So when that happens, um, it's private and it's internal. And I think Mercury being under the beams of the sun right now, but in mutual reception with the sun, the potential for some inner realizations that are sweet and subtle, and they don't need to be put into action. They don't need to go and do things. They don't need to be shared. We don't need to Facebook it. We don't need to Instagram a picture of how nice it looks. We just enjoy the insight. 
I think that's there right now as well because Mercury being under the beams of the sun, invisible, there's something, you know, Mercury is, spends a lot of the time invisible. Mercury is, of course, one of the gods that's allowed to go in and out of Hades, the realm of, that's very invisible to us. Um, and this is also correlated with Mercury's diving uh, from the you know evening star to the morning star, disappearing behind the beams of the sun a lot. Um, our spirit guides are guiding us even when we don't know it, right? So um, one of the things that we have to do in order to foster a relationship with our spirit guides that can be more active is learn how to hold the realizations, insights, and teachings they give us in a private space, in a quieter and more invisible space. Then their teachings become more obvious to us. So for example, when that person who's wondering if meditation has worked or not, right? When they, when they have that insight, like, wow, yeah, maybe that, that meditation actually helped me get out of a relationship, right? The, the thing, so then, then they've gained some understanding of Mercury's, their spirit guides, invisible workings, their, their higher intelligence chose to meditate. And then, you know, uh, their, their, their guidance system brought them along in ways that they weren't always even aware of. We think we're meditating or we're doing X, Y, and Z, and it's accomplishing X, Y, and Z. We think we're in control of it all. But actually, when we do even the smallest spiritual thing, we really have no idea the degree to which we're starting to surrender our control over a lot of things. And it takes a long time of doing that surrendering to start to realize the ways in which the surrendering process is changing us. So any message I could give right now about Mercury and the sun would basically just be to See if you can find the invisible footprints of your spirit guide right now, of Mercury, giving you messages, helping you polish that higher intelligence, and giving you some deeper understanding of how far your path has already taken you. Um, and, and the more we can kind of internalize that, the more that we'll pick up on the subtle, invisible presence of our spiritual guidance. Uh, so that's my message there. All right, last but not least, and as promised, let's talk about Mars and the sun. So first of all, Anytime the sun is moving into a conjunction with a superior planet, that would be a superior planet being the slower moving planets in the traditional Chaldean order. That's uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. When the sun conjoins that planet, <clears throat> it's the start of a new cycle. Okay, so the start of the new cycle is like a rebirth moment. What happens right before that, as the sun is moving to within 15 degrees, down to like eight degrees and even closer, is that planet is at the end stage of its life cycle. So it's kind of dying, it's weakening. Um, and it's uh, about to be reborn, but it's in a stage of, of weakness. And that means something different for every planet. You can think about it as the planet losing strength but what does that even mean? What does it mean if a planet is losing strength? Like, how are we supposed to think about that? Most people don't think about that at all. They just say, oh, the planet's weaker. Well, so what? What does that mean? Well, let's just say Mars right now is weakened. That can mean a variety of things. Uh, listen to what uh, <clears throat> Alcabisi said, medieval uh, astrologer, uh, and Abu Mushar listen to what they say about when a planet comes to within, when the sun comes to within that close proximity to Mars. Then from a distance of 60 degrees after direct motion, they're called Western going toward weakness. That's where we've been recently. Then they become Western weak until they enter under the rays of the sun. At which point he goes on to say that the planet under the sun is considered oppressed. Okay, so what does an oppressed Mars look like? Well, let's take a hint from William Lilly, a Renaissance astrologer. When he says, when he says this about Mars, when ill-placed, which would be combust, among other things, then he is a prattler without modesty or honesty. So let's talk about that for a second. Mars is like a knight or a warrior. That's an image that everybody knows with Mars. Okay, so what happens when you have the worst, weakest qualities of someone who is born with that constitution of a warrior? Well, one thing is that they don't have modesty or honesty, and they're a prattler. 
<laughs> okay. Does that make sense? Have you ever met someone who's just belligerent, aggressive, but they also tend to be dishonest, kind of self-centered. They go on and on about things. They, they, they prattle. They like to get into it with people in, in negative ways. They're not modest. Okay. So that's Mars when Mars is weak. <clears throat> a strong Mars would be courageous. Lily says, in feats of war, in courage, invincible. Right? That's, that's Mars well-placed. A lover of slaughter and quarrels when ill-placed. Murder, thievery, a promoter of sedition, phrase, and commotions. A highway thief as wavering as the wind. A traitor, a turbulent spirit. Perjured, obscene, rash, inhumane. Neither fearing God or caring for man. Unthankful, treacherous, oppressors, ravenous, cheating, furious, violent. <clears throat> that's, that's Mars when Mars is <clears throat> not so good. And of course, we all have days where Mars is not so good. Like I'm, when I was 14 years old, right? Uh, I think there were times where you could call me a highway thief, <laughs> a highway robber. <laughs> I grew up in the church as a preacher's kid, and I, I used to sneak into the secretary's office after church and steal some money so that I could go from the offering plates. It's horrible. So I, could go, so I could go to the store and buy some candy, right? So, um, and during that time, I had a hard Mars transit, or I had a hard, uh, hard Saturn transit going on to Mars and Gemini. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know a little bit about astrology, you can laugh at that with me. Uh, we've all had bad days where the worst part of a planet is going to come out. Uh, and this languaging, the sort of Renaissance languaging, we might find different language for today, but you get the, the idea. The idea is that Mars weakened can mean uh, a Mars that is the worst kind of Mars. So Mars weakened does not mean, for example, that, well, I'm trying to, uh, like, I'm trying to, uh, you know, hammer a nail in the wall, but I'm just not strong enough. <laughs> I'm just like, just throwing my wrist at it, but I, I can't find any strength. That's not actually what it means. Mars that combusts the sun being consumed by the fire of the sun uh, can bring out the worst in Mars. Now, Mars is interesting because some people actually debate this with Mars. Some people will say, you know, Mars is naturally a fiery planet, uh, hot, hot and dry, and excessively hot and dry. This is why Mars was placed in the evening sect of planets. Traditionally, uh, Ptolemy tells us, for example, that Mars is part of the nighttime sect because we want to bring out the best in Mars, and Mars does better in the evening hours when things are cool. During the day, excessively rash, hot, dry, fiery. Be careful of that. One would think, based on that reasoning, that the sun combustion to Mars could be pretty intense. But... We also have to imagine that, you know, sometimes the sun has been, uh, the Mars has been talked about as sort of like the right arm of the sun. If the sun is the king, then Mars is the king's military, or the, the king's like chief commander or general or whatever. So we have to then imagine that um, there, it is possible right now especially when the Kazemi comes around at the very beginning of September, and I'm going to be doing a separate video on the Kazemi. Today, I want to talk about the combustion. Um, the Kazemi could lead to a sense of Mars being greatly empowered and virtuous and strong and noble and, and empowered to do something special. Just as uh, Venus was at the heart of the sun in Leo earlier in August. So we'll talk about that come the beginning of September. But for now, what can we do with like a weak Mars? What, what, what teachings can we take away from a weak Mars? Well, first of all, um, like look at the house that it's falling in in your chart, right? For example, in my chart, Virgo is my whole sign fifth house. So I look at the whole sign fifth house and I'm like, okay, well, among other things, children. So my three and a half going on four-year-old daughter, she is going through some tantrumy stuff right now. Not surprising, she's a Virgo rising. Mars has just entered her first house. So um, what can I do as Mars is getting burnt up by the sun and the tantrums are crazy? And my other daughter is struggling too. She's just over one. Um, well, uh, first of all, I can recognize that, um, you know, it's a good time to try to bring the tension down rather than reacting, which is only going to escalate and make everything worse. 
that's normal wisdom. Like probably a lot of parents know that, but just knowing right now that it's a particularly volatile time for Mars, I can also reassure myself when I start trying to make a mountain out of a molehill and I start saying, hey, you know what? My daughter is like uh, going nuts. She must have some kind of behavioral issue. This is some huge deal. No, nah, it'll, it's going to pass, you know, by the end of September, we're, we're out of this zone. And after, even by the beginning of September, after the Kazemi happens, Mars will start to recover and gain its own light and start becoming strong again uh, in the East. So I know because I'm an astrologer, because I study the movements of the planets, I know that, yeah, this is a rough patch, but I got to not react to it right? Because my, my three and a half year old doesn't have maybe the same capacity to not react to it, but I sure do, right? I can at least try. So that's the kind of thing that we could take right now in general. You could use that analogy as an analogy, right? If you are feeling really temperamental and kind of crazy, especially in Virgo, right? This is a mercury ruled sign, um, especially if it's mentally, intellectually, organizationally, if you're kind of feeling like, oh, I just want to like, you know, <laughs> like burn all of the, the crap that I don't need and want and kind of like tidy everything and get everything perfect. And yeah, okay. But just remember, I've said this a bunch at the end of this month with all the, the earthy energy, just don't get too white knuckled about everything. That Mars is really hot and fiery right now and can be a perfectionist, can be very critical and cutting. It's not a good time to start at the gym if your voice inside of you is like, you know, you lazy, ugly slob, you know, go do something, right? Because then you're going to go to the gym and what? You're probably going to, you know, pull a muscle in your neck trying to lift a car above your head or something like that. I mean, so be careful of responding to the highway robber inside of you right now that wants to steal your piece. Be careful of the voice of... um you know, harsh mental criticism, pickiness, productivity, you get it all done right now. You rush through that, you know, like you won't be happy until it's done. Be careful about that. This is not going away right away. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather not be a, driven by a voice inside of me that's not very nice for like, you know, a week or two. So be careful of that. And be careful. Remember, so there's a child in you right? That's the, that's the analogy. There's a child in you. And that child is maybe just going through a little bit of a regressive phase for a, a few weeks. We hit these little moments in our life where we regress into being harsh, being critical, being severe in some way, being rash. So just be nice to yourself and be nice to others. And if people around you are crabby, if they're very harsh, critical, cutting, just remember that, um, you know, the, the person that issues, harshness, and cutting words, um, it, it hurts us. It actually hurts us to be hurtful. So we're hurting ourselves when we're like that. And one of the things that we have to learn how to do is how to find equanimity. You know, when someone insults or criticizes us, we say, you have to stay humble. You have to stay modest. You have to stay, um, uh, don't try to get big, right? Um, one of my spiritual teachers says, you know, that one of the the, the mottos of our culture is, I'm the man, you know, or even I'm the woman, or I'm, I'm, I'm the lady, I'm the guy, whatever, right? Uh, I'm the, I'm the, I'm it. So, if that's where we're going, right, if that, if we're, if we go that way, we end up having to suffer the burden of that pressure. It's not a good thing to try to, you know, hold on to this idea of being it, being, being the man, being the woman. So, Similarly, um, we have to be uh, really careful right now that we're not placing the, um, when we, first of all, when we see people that are suffering or struggling um, with criticism or harshness or whatever, just remember that it's just that. They're suffering, they're struggling. When, they, when people emote and erupt with stuff like that, it's, they're actually suffering that. They may not feel that way because they're trying to direct it at someone or something, but you, we have a choice as to whether or not we're going to receive that at a deep level. We're human. Things can hurt. That's okay. But we also have the choice to uh, not take that, not let that in. We, that's where our higher intelligence can come in and say, is this criticism founded? Sometimes, yes, it is. But the tone of voice wasn't really nice. 
right? So I'm not going to take that tone, but I'll take, I'll take the suggestion. To compartmentalize like that is not easy, but we can do that right now. And that's also the benefit of having that Mercury-Sun mutual reception. Mars might be very cutting. Sometimes the most cutting things that we hear are true, but you know that doesn't mean that we should take the abuse that comes with them. So sometimes abusive people say true things and then they like to think that their abusiveness is excused because they said something that was true, right? You see what I'm saying? So compartmentalizing a little bit could be helpful right now. Thinking of people out there right now who are demonstrating this kind of maybe intense aggressiveness or being really hard on themselves or others or anything like that, um, just remembering that like that, that actually hurts them. And same, by the same token, when we, in our mind, when our mind and our heart and our emotions and our body focuses on compassion, patience, love, caring, even in our thoughts, we receive the benefit of those thoughts because those thoughts are healthy. Those thoughts create happiness. Uh, so, you know, it's like, it's like our brain is like a pulsating flower, right? And if in our, in our, our, our body too, if we focus on thoughts that are patient, kind, loving, even with ourselves, gently allowing for criticism, instruction, correction to come in, but doing so with tenderness and peace, uh, then we can change, we can grow, we can do better, we can correct faults or flaws. We can do so while that flower is still sort of pulsating with, a, with, the, uh, with peacefulness, with beauty, with the fragrance of love. We start just annihilating that flower when we start sending out cutting stuff inward or outward. We think, well, once I perfect, once I get it right, once they get it right, you know, then there'll be peace. They have to earn peace. No, actually, it's the other way around. Peace brings change. Love brings change. We have to focus on that first. And then all of the things that we want or desire that we see as imperfect or broken or faulty or flawed or hurtful, they naturally start to heal. You can't put the uh, cart before the horse. The horse that's leading this whole thing is love and peace. So that's something to think about. The other thing that I want to talk about today comes from yoga philosophy. So the sun and Mars, when they're together, can also speak towards things that we are, that we feel in, inimical towards. Um, there are a lot of things in our life that can agitate us, that can irritate us, that can get under our skin, that can prod or poke us. Um, and things that will, you know, literally try to stab, invade, come into our space. Um, and we all have sensitivities, right, to what has hurt us or what bothers us or what feels threatening. Um, one of the ways that we have of coping with um, hurt and pain and intrusions and trespasses in the world is to set up really rigid boundaries. Keep that person out, keep that thing out, you know, and, and so we become inimical. Politically, this happens all the time, right? Like whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or something else, one of the ways that we define ourselves is in terms of my dislike for that other thing. And the problem with this, whether it's in politics or our friendship circles or at work with a, you know, someone you work with, is that, and I'm not saying anything that probably you all don't know, but when we make what we are, uh, when we try to make a, a stand for what we are based on opposition to what we are not, um, we have a problem. So, the Yoga Sutras, as well as the Bhagavad Purana, as well as the Bhagavad Gita, as well as the, um, uh, the uh, Vedas and the Vedanta Sutra, so many uh, classic uh, yoga philosophy texts tell us that whatever the object of our meditation is, um, that that's what we become like. We become like that. So if you meditate all the time, for example, on... Uh, it, for example, when we do our yoga postures, we are learning to embody some of the grace, strength, and beauty of different animals, right? That's why the postures look like animals. 
And what we're doing in there is making our meditation upon those animals, bringing something of that spirit into our life. Because that spirit then, it, we become like it and we take on some of the good qualities of that, that, uh, that spirit or that animal or that posture. So similarly, if you're on the news all the time or if you're thinking all the time about the things that you don't like, and that's how you're trying to define what you are, actually, you're meditating, you're, you're meditating and being absorbed on what you don't like makes you more like it. And that is something that it's subtle. And so we don't realize it. Um, so uh, let's be careful right now of what we are feeling inimical towards, because it's possible that you become more like that by giving it more of your time, your attention, your energy, right? And so forth. So some people will, will for example, um, criticize spiritual people for staying out of politics. I get this a lot, actually. Um, where people will write me and say, you know, um, share more of your political views openly, or they'll say, I don't like that you said this little political remark or that or whatever. So I'm a political animal, just like anyone else. Of course, I have opinions. Um, but one of the reasons that I actively work to not let those political issues define me or my spiritual life is because I become what I'm absorbed in. And my top priority is to be absorbed in peace, prayer, and divinity, which to me transcends the polarities of this world that are constantly becoming one another because they can't exist without this kind of ex exclusive yet ironic focus on what they are not. And so to me, the political world mostly, though I vote and whatever, to, to me, the political world is mostly not what I want to be absorbed in because I've noticed for myself that when I get absorbed in it, I start becoming everything that I try to define myself apart from. And I find that cycle very maddening and, you know, deeply um, uh, stressful. So a lot of the times people will say to, you know, people who are, uh, to, who have, a spiritual life and they'll they will they'll be sort of like Ugh, about politics they'll be like no no you know you have to be engaged in the world you have to fight you have to da 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 and the simple answer to that is no you don't you're a human being with a choice you get to choose what you meditate on and um if you don't want to be absorbed in uh, uh political um polarization you don't um, similarly, in our lives, you have a crappy coworker, fine, you have a crappy coworker. You may not like them, but does that mean you have to be absorbed in your enmity towards them? You're, do you have to stay absorbed in what they're doing wrong, even if it's unjust? Do you have to stay absorbed in it? No. So one of the teachings of yoga uh, is how do we have opinions? How do we even be a political animal, as Aristotle said? How do we notice injustice? How do we be anything without being so in a way that engages us in this kind of inimical meditation where we become the object of what we despise? Because anything we're focused on, we're, we are natural meditators. We, we meditate all the time, but it's just when we're going through our lives and we think we're in control of everything, we don't realize what kinds of trances we're getting ourselves into. So, um, you know, the idea here of developing spiritually. And the thing that astrology is here to help us with is to, to help us realize that whatever we are fixated on, whatever is the object of our meditation, whatever we're absorbed in regularly, that's what we become like. And so we have to be careful when it comes to being a Republican or being a Democrat or being a father or being, you know, being an astrologer or being whatever we're being. Because if we get absorbed in it, in a way that makes our, us inimical to all sorts of other stuff, then we're, first of all, we're easily pushed around. We lose control. And just like a highway robber, we can be stripped of our peace very easily. So um, that's just something to think about. I'm thinking about it right now because Mars is being burnt up by the sun and it's easy to be absorbed with what we oppose and then to become like that. So when my daughter, again, just to go back to that analogy, when she gets really pissed off about something, 
and she's like tantruming or whatever. Like she can't have something. She wants a cookie or God knows what. But when that happens, she gets under my skin, right? Because it's like loud and it's irritating. And it's like, oh my God, do we really have to have another like, you know, symbol crashing moment here for 10 minutes or whatever. Um, so it's a good place to practice for me. That's not the object of my meditation. I, I love her. I see what's happening. I'm going to try to help, but I'm not going to get absorbed in it. Very important that we be more selective about what we're absorbed in. This has the potential as the sun goes into the Kazemi with Mars in the beginning of September to suddenly move us into a place where we know the noble way of applying our will and our power and our force and our vigor, Mars, because our higher intelligence, sun, has now informed us this is where to apply your time and energy. This is what you should be absorbed in that will bring you peace. So we'll keep the, the flower of the mind in a peaceful place, right? Giving and receiving patience, peace, love, tolerance. So uh, in the scriptures, in the Bhagavad Purana, in the Krishna Bhakti tradition, there's something that is two things that you see happening for people who eventually come into deeper surrendered relationship with the higher self, with Krishna or with God or whatever you want to call it. Uh, there's two ways. One is life, the, the way of defining ourselves in opposition, comparison, jealousy, envy, competition, greed, dominance, consumerism, fear, right? As much as we try to define ourselves through participation in the world that is happening um, through the lens of those activities, uh, the more that we, um, we develop anger, lust and anger, right? And the world is burning with this, the Bhagavad Gita tells us. And so um, if, if we are consumed by that, then eventually what happens is life breaks us down, right? The opposition eventually invades us, hurts us, harms us, traumatizes us. And then we throw up our hands and we go, okay, there's got to be a different way. There's got to be a different way. Eventually, the madness just consumes us. It's like a forest fire. We suddenly realize the forest is on fire and I got to get out of here. So then we start asking honest questions about how to change our focus. Um, and that's not something that can happen intellectually just because some dude on a YouTube channel is talking about it, right? That has to happen in the core of your heart and your, your experience has to take you to that place. And that's the one way that many people in the scriptures, in the stories of the Puranas, for example, end up coming to a spiritual life. But there's another way, and I find this one almost more interesting. The second way is that there's the stories of all these different devotees, people who become, you know, spiritual, let's say, devoted. They become, they, they start leading a devotional, a spiritual life. Um, and their story is about being inimical to Krishna in the in these stories or God or let's even just say your higher self um, they're inimical towards that they 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 don't like God you don't talk about God I don't like that right there's you know all of this it, it just intent and however you conceptualize divinity if you don't like the word God fine but I am I am angry at that. I don't like that. I don't like the pressure that places on me. Anyone who says that is just fake. They're just right. So people who are triggered very deeply, just like you can be triggered by your coworker or by a Democrat or a Republican or your mother or your screaming kid or whatever, or yourself. When, when divinity is triggering for us, um, that's another kind of interesting personality that we see in the scriptures. In uh, the case of, there's this one sort of, <clears throat> there's this one sort of figure in particular who is inimical towards divinity, just pisses him off, right? Just as like, ah, oh, just whatever. But it becomes so, he, there's so much of his life that ends up becoming about trying to block that out, trying to oppose that, tr trying to, you know, say that, that people who have peace or who have some degree of surrender, who are trying to live a spiritual life, that they're all phony or that they're all fake or whatever. And the inimicalness that this uh, particular character feels towards uh, God uh, actually prepares that person to be 
enlightened. Because remember, we become what we oppose. We become what we oppose. So when we have opposition towards saintly people, like God, I don't know who's sitting around being like, I hate Mother Teresa, right? <laughs> right? Or, or, you know, some other great saint or some, right? But there are people who just get mad and they just, they're just bothered by things that are actually good for them. And what we need to understand is that this is actually working on us. Like, for example, when my wife is like, you know, you shouldn't eat that. You should eat this. It's better for you. She's definitely like uh, being an herbalist. She often will spot me when I'm like, I would rather have a French fry than, than like, you know, some more vegetables or something. Right. So, and, you know, my reaction is like, like, I, you know, I get so mad. But the thing is, is that it's that exact, the more like willful and defiant and like pissed off I get about that, the more that it's absorbing me through my anger in the thing that's actually good for me. So there's this, I'm not suggesting that we all go get, you know, pissed off at things that are good for us and then that will make us good. But there is some truth to behind the idea that whatever we're inimical towards, we eventually draw closer towards. So there's all of these stories in the Puranas about people who basically hate God. And it, what they don't realize is that in their hatred towards divinity, towards their higher self, they are actually in deeply focused and absorbing themselves in that exact thing. So in this one case, this particular character gets killed by the Sudarshan chakra and, and basically um, the Sudarshan chakra is the Lord's weapon of time. The Sudarshan chakra is the wheel of time and it's a blade and it cuts everything down in time. So the idea is that if we are inimical towards that, which is actually good for us, peace, love, patience, tolerance, kindness, if we think, no, I've got to be mad, I've got to be pissed, I've got to be whatever, um, it, you know, in time, our opposition to those qualities will get the best of us. The Sudarshan chakra, the weapon of time, time itself will eventually cut us down and make us into the good things that we're trying to oppose. So I also wanted to bring that up today because sometimes I find that when in my 10 years of doing this, that when Mars has combust the sun, that I also notice that I just get pissed off about the things that are actually good for me. And um, that's a hard thing to deal with when you're, when you're pissed about the stuff that you know you should be doing. Um, and uh, I try to remember that that form of meditation, even though it's not healthy, um, you know, that's going to take me down in time. And it's, it's going to win. You know what I mean? Like if I stay pissed off about the things that are good for me, like eventually those good things are going to come into my life. So why make it so hard on myself? You know how long it takes for the Sudarshan chakra to kill this individual in the Puranas? It takes 108 years for this weapon to basically cut, sever the head, right? And that's that sounds kind of gruesome, but it's actually uh, metaphorical because we're we're talking about a great astronomical cycle of time that it takes to, you know, basically chop off the, the, the uh, head of this, this being that's really like trying to hurt and harm anyone who's doing anything good. So it's time itself that works on that being. But then when that being is slain, enlightenment. Such a paradox that that being who is so inimical towards so many things would actually also be getting enlightened by the process of being inimical to so many things. That's, that is something that's very deep and very difficult to comprehend. And it, again, we don't take that and encourage people to be inimical towards anyone or anything. The real point of that story is, you know, it's a lot easier if we just surrender and uh, try doing our part and be careful of becoming inimical towards something because it's a slow, painful death. All right, so that's what I've got for you all today. This is a longer talk on Mars's combustion with the sun. I hope it was interesting for you and you got some other good stuff for uh, uh, today's lunar transits as well. All right, thanks so much, everyone. We'll be back again soon. Take care. Bye.